From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars, pop culture, and the ultimate adventure, life itself. I'm Ken Hapsock. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And we're here to talk about news. We're here to talk about hype. We're here to talk about our thoughts and hopes for Bad Batch Season 3. That's a lot coming your way, so let's get right to the housekeeping that we love doing around here. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Center. Over 180,000 titles and growing to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I don't know about the Vision Pro. We'll find out about the Vision Pro. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear anything on the Vision Pro. I'm uh, not sure about that. So uh, that's our first bit of housekeeping, Joseph. Though we have uh, the A's, we, we have usually an ask, but we're, we're starting with announcements. That's right. We got a ton of announcements, uh, including 007 Center. This is very close to our hearts. This was such a thrill. Uh, Ken and I are recording deep dive discussions of the Daniel Craig James Bond film. Uh, We did our first one. I made myself a Vesper, and I think I mostly held it together for over two hours of broadcasting while sipping (laughs) uh, a nice big cocktail. Anyway, uh, our big deep dive discussion of 2006 Casino Royale is now available to all patrons. So if you're currently a patron of our Patreon, you can check out the video version or the audio version. Or if you're not a patron for absolutely any reason, but you're still interested, you can buy it uh, a la carte, uh, as they say at restaurants. You can just buy... The uh, the deep dive discussion of Casino Royale, three dollars for the audio version and five dollars for the video version. That's right, a two dollar upsell for faces. <laughs> is that fair? I don't, are, is, are our faces worth two dollars, Ken? What do you maybe? Think? Maybe not my face, but you, sir, uh, I think so. Uh, yeah, wonderful. I love the use of a la carte. I've been stuck on the available for purchase, like uh, I'm a flight attendant, which sometimes I, I wish I was. Uh, so it's it was a lot of fun. It was the I think in the running for one of the longest files ever exported in our wow. show's history. It was it was a big one. We talked for you know almost two uh, two hour two and a half hours about uh, Casino Royale with faces. So yeah, with faces, if you want to yeah. check it out, you can go to patreoncom uh, center slash shop Correct. Yes, that's it. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we're not done with announcements. Uh, we also uh, have Jedi Beat, right, Jennifer? Mm -hmm, That's right. It is coming next Monday, the 19th. Uh, It's basically Star Wars meets NPR, as Joseph always says, which I love (laughs) that description because it makes me feel like I'm a documentarian working (laughs) on public radio. Uh, But it's all Star Wars themed, obviously, behind the scenes. Uh, The first one will be the Moss Eisley Cantina, which Mm. has been that's a lot of fun. If I yeah. do say so myself, <laughs> uh, I can't wait to I can't wait to hear it, see it, uh, because yes, you have made so many changes from the initial versions yeah. that I can't wait to hear all the all the new stuff and see all the visuals. I got to get it out because I'm going to keep doing it. I just re-recorded the first episode again. I, I don't even know. I have like my <laughs> files are like final, final. Okay, this time final. <laughs> Seriously, self. I love final. That. Yeah. This is it. Uh, yeah, when we were we were putting together the uh, the music for uh, the Moon Agers, we have each song has about six finals. Like wow. final, the real underscore the real final. Nope, use this one. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> nope, I get use it. this one exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it there. Uh, well, I'm so excited for the Jedi beat because it is uh, moved beyond what was even originally discussed and pitched inter- inter- internally or externally, which was, hey, we'll just take those audio files, we'll throw some images up, and we'll put them up on YouTube and see see how people take them. Uh, the fact that, Jen, you've, you've reworked them, they are almost, uh, it's a see it again for the first time type of situation, uh, and I'm excited to see uh, what you've, like Joseph said, what you've come up with there. So February yeah. 19th. For that, uh, but speaking of taking old files and saying, "Hey, look at them again, rediscover them, or enjoy them again," the Data Bank Brawl Rewind is in effect. Uh, episode two is up. We are just releasing this on the podcast side, uh, taking the old sh- shows they were buried in our feed, and we're uh, bringing them to the light again. And it's already been fun to see people uh, uh, react and kind of relive some of the wild memories of just two episodes in. We got a lot to go, so look for those every <laughs> Sunday here on the podcast feed. That is right. right. So before we get into the uh, news of last week, uh, we, we kind of don't cover Star Wars news as much anymore, uh, just because there's only so much you can say about a Hasbro Pulse concept art of a 
<laughs> figure or a toy. Uh, we've moved on from some of that, but we want to talk about the big news or things that happened, and we're going to be doing that shortly here. Uh, but before we do, we always do like to catch up with Star Wars and Life Adventures. This is called Podcast Banter to the people still yelling about this on threads. Uh, not at us, but just in general. It's been an interesting conversation that's only unfolded on threads mm. of podcast banter, um, which I see both sides of it. But we love catching up. Uh, we love kind of sharing our lives and how Star Wars finds it. Uh, so, Jen, uh, fire away. Life and Star Wars adventures. I realized that we were going to be talking about The Bad Batch Season 2, which I had not seen. I realized that on Thursday evening that I had not watched one single episode of Season 2. <laughs> I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> my daughter was going to have her friend over. We had birthday parties. And I'm like, I have to watch, scroll, 16 episodes. <laughs> that was eight. I thought it was eight. Oh, I terribly no. miscalculated. Yeah. I began my binging session on Friday, and every waking moment, literally in my bed, I was like falling asleep in the morning. My daughter came and watched it with me. <laughs> I'm watching it at you know 11:30 at night. I'm watching it during the Super Bowl. I miss the Super Bowl because I'm like Bad Batch wow. takes precedence, mm. and I watched it and I finished it last night. And then I was like, dang it. When's season three coming out? I got, <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Oh, oh good. my gosh. It was That's an so adventure. Great. Yeah. It's not and easy to binge. It's a hard one to binge, right? Just yes, on an emotional is. level of like, yeah, give me a break. Give me a break. Uh, well, I can't wait to get uh, your your thoughts on it when we discuss a little bit more of our, our hopes and dreams for Bad Batch season three, which we're going to do in the, the second half of the show today. Mm -hmm. that's, that's right yeah, one, that's right uh, that's a true hero's journey jen what you mm -hmm. right there <laughs> i mean missed the big sports championship contest for that i did <laughs> and all the halftime shows commercials and if Depends. only we could get reaction shots of taylor swift watching deeply emotional episodes of bad <laughs> i would enjoy that <laughs> let's just super that, that. Yeah. Uh, uh speaking of super bowl commercials we had a great uh, subjective worth discussion uh friday last week halftime show versus commercials uh and jen in discord our four center discord uh people found your commercial and posted it oh my mm. gosh how funny and it was bef I remember it. It was before I knew of a Jennifer Landa. Uh, <laughs> to uh, the 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 husband in that uh, uh, show. I knew Damien. <laughs> yes, Damien. Yes. Yeah. I, small world. And I and I remember watching the commercial, going, "Damien got a Super Bowl commercial! Yay!" No idea who you were yet, but so happy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I still see him every now and then at auditions. Every now yeah. and then. Yeah, nice guy. Uh, good dude. Good dude. Uh, Joseph. Uh, uh, any adventures for you this week? Did you need to binge something in a short amount of time? Uh, no, this is a this was a uh, one of those weeks where you know the sort of video game analogy for life of like you've got a main quest and you look mm -hmm. at your your you know week and you're like I'm on a main quest, but in that sort of video <laughs> game way, <laughs> you know, you're like I gotta put out the fire in the fire castle, but I need water. But in order to get water, <laughs> I need to get a fishing pole. But the farmer won't give me his pole unless I collect 800 zoom buggle beetles kind of thing <laughs> oh, that was my week uh as, as collecting yeah. beetles uh so ha having a hard time uh focusing the only star wars adventures i had we're going to talk about of the uh the hype uh for the legitimate hmm. hype for the phantom menace 25th anniversary and the uh the misguided speculation hmm. about a kenobi announcement that was my big star wars adventure so my main life adventure was it was really fun to watch the super bowl after we talked about the commercials uh, versus the halftime show. I enjoyed the actual uh, game as much as I, you know, understand football. It was a lot of leg injuries. I didn't like that. Uh, that was, yeah. it was mm -hmm. the leg injury bowl. Uh, that was mm -hmm. not uh, exciting to me, but I understand an exciting mm -hmm. game. Oh, but man, and I, I enjoyed the halftime show. I don't know a lot of Usher's work, but I thought it was well done and fascinating spe spectacle. But the commercials just bummed me out. <laughs> I, I was thinking about your uh, old commercial, Jennifer. He's like, just actors. Doing mm -hmm. doing a solid joke, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, I I know I'm just I'm on this train because I think culture is on this train of making choices that are just kind of constantly dehumanizing. And and a, you know, the the Super Bowl just isn't anywhere near as much fun for me because social media has been shattered and there just aren't as many people talking about it and they're spread everywhere. So it's not mm -hmm. as engaging. Mm -hmm. And then every commercial is uh, got a large amount of CGI and almost every single commercial is of uh, famous people being self-deprecating yes which like hey 
that used to be fun back in the day when sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, famous people were behind a wall and we didn't have access to every mm -hmm. single mm -hmm. thing they did or thought. But now after four hours of like every celebrity going, look, I can poke fun at myself. It starts to feel so deeply authentic where the key joke of it is celebrities. They're just like us. <laughs> they make mistakes. They do this. They do that. But after four hours of it, it feels robotic to Yes. For celebrities yeah. to be in everything, almost yes. like randomly matched to products, like there's a secret meeting. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and you get assigned this and you get, do you get a soda? Do you get, you know, foot cream? Who cares? They just mm -hmm. swap them celebrities around and then all of you be just a little self-deprecating, you know, to be real. And, and that's the thing that got me. It's not any individual commercial or celebrity, but just this feeling of, that we're in so much of a world where everyone is trying to prove they're authentic to the point of becoming extremely inauthentic in it. In the yes. Super Bowl celebrity, <laughs> I'm just a person like you. It mm -hmm. was sort of like, to me, like the height of the inauthentic authenticity. Hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. I, you know, everyone, every once in a while, commercial like it hits. I, I enjoyed the Affleck Dunkin' Donut one for it was the yes. Matt Damon part that got me. But uh, it's funny, Scar yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's funny, but, but to your point, like when when there's one with like Scorsese, and I'm like, how did they even? How did that happen? Like what? <laughs> and then it ends with Martin Scorsese in a limo. Like what? Mm. <laughs> and, mm. I, and it speaks to your point of just it used to be. And I saw uh, the author Jeff Perlman tweet about this too. He's like. You know, it used to be like two or three commercials would stand out because of that, because it was, a, oh, my God, they got, you know, Brian Cranston here. And now that it's such a formula. It, 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 the, the shock value is gone. I think you're so right, Joseph. It's robotic and it's formula uh, and it's it's uncreative and it's copycat creativity. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. I like the Jeremy oh. Renner one uh, yeah. because it was a, <laughs> it, it, a lot of them were, Hey, this, uh, celebrity is flawed. And Jeremy Renner's was, I survived getting run over by a tractor. <laughs> I can't remember what his accident was, but the whole thing was about, it was selling some sort of milk. Silk. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, even what it was. It was selling some sort of breakfast fluid, but the whole thing was kind of predicated on I'm feeling good. I survived oh. a horrific accident, which that oh, one was wow. like, okay, well, that's pretty authentic. I don't yeah. think Tina Fey was recently run over by a tractor. So this feels authentic. <laughs> wow. Okay, I missed a lot. I missed a lot, apparently. I like the Beyonce one. That, uh, if, I don't know if that was more of a commercial or like an announcement. And then Tony Hale's there. Tony I'm like, Hale's what? There, yeah. What's Tony Hale doing there? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my rant. Uh, these are supposed to be life and Star Wars adventures, and I, I apologize. I turned it into uh, a rant. No, and, I mean, that was that was your adventure. That was what you yeah. were going through. Um, it's a valid rant. Uh, for me, you know, I really love what you're saying about we, uh, video game quests. I had a lot of A and B storylines this week that crashed into <laughs> C storylines, and then the C storyline needed to become an A storyline. I, I had to turn a, a, a spec script in for something, a, a job I'm trying to get. So all all hands on deck for that. But I couldn't put my energy into it until late in the week. Uh, had had a had a fun event to attend, but it was three hours away, which on mm. on the map it should be forty. Uh, and it was just one of those weekends, and so everything kind of uh, kept going. But in the middle, I'm glad we're discussing the news here in a second because that was that was the one little explosion of Star Wars I had was mm. the 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 Empire magazine stuff we're going to discuss. So that was a, so in a weird way we're going to talk about it from all angles. But it was just fun to have that moment to be like, oh yeah, oh that's right, I love Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. That's great. <laughs> So that's it, and we're going to get to some Star Wars news here. Uh, this is uh, what happens on Friday, uh, but it, the, the tease came earlier, and Joseph, I'm going to pitch it to you to get us through mm -hmm. this uh, discussion of it here, but I think by now everyone knows that the, the Empire Magazine folks put out a tease. I have some thoughts on the tease uh, <laughs> and what it did, mm -hmm. uh, but that all ended to the articles coming out. Uh, the 25th anniversary of Phantom Menace is this year, and in May, it's 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 hard to wrap my head around it. The 20th was hard. 25 <laughs> is, is another level. But Joseph, uh, we're going to discuss everything about it here now. Yeah, so I think there are different ways to look at it. There's the the discussion of the hype that built up, the way Empire handled the announcement, and so there's yeah, there's some challenging things to talk about. And we're definitely going to talk about those. But we also want to talk about, I think, the pivot that a lot of Star Wars fans made online to be like, no, we're celebrating Phantom Menace. So we're going to talk about Empire. But even before that, so the the Empire teased an announcement uh, on on 
Thursday. The announcement was on Friday. But then on Saturday, they had another announcement that Empire was the first uh, to put out, which is that Phantom Menace is being re-released into the theater uh, for the 25th anniversary. This is what the StarWars.com website now says. Announced today, Saturday, February 10th, by Empire Magazine. Star Wars The Phantom Menace will return to theaters for its 25th anniversary starting May 3rd to coincide with the re-release. Artist Matt Ferguson has created a beautiful new poster, which you can see below. I didn't cut that part out of the text, but obviously you can't see it below if you're <laughs> listening to the podcast or watching it. But you can Google it. Uh, so I, I wanted to start with that because that in some ways feels like the biggest news of the weekend that it is actually being re-released into theaters. So Ken... Are you were you excited by the re-release of the movie? Are you going? What do you want out of it if you do go? I'm very uh, intrigued and excited. I think I might try to go. I usually don't pop out for those uh, anniversary screenings, I, but that's just because I just don't go to movies much uh, unless I'm at home. Uh, and even then, I don't do as much as, as I've said before. So, but I, there's something about it, and what I what what I, what I would want for from it is is exactly what I think when you celebrate here, but today that community uh, and to <laughs> see it. I didn't see the 3D re-release, uh, so to go now and to go as the the tide has turned on the discussion and uh, reception to this film would be a fun experience. Twenty five years after, uh, the feeling wasn't uh, exactly that when I saw it mm -hmm. the first eight times in the theater. So that's what I would hope. <laughs> How about you, Jennifer? Are you going to go? Are you excited to go? I am so excited. I, I immediately told my husband, "I'm taking Lucia, who's our older child." And he's like, "Wait, hold on." Why don't we all go as a family? I'm like, oh yeah, I guess we could. Oh, but I, <laughs> I was like, I don't know how the four year old is gonna deal with like some of the slower parts, like the Trade Federation. Or my husband's like, what about Darth Maul? I'm like, Darth Maul's not scary. She's seen plenty of plenty of scarier things. Like it's mm -hmm. pretty tame in comparison to some of the things that they show nowadays. So, uh, yeah, I'm just and more so for the communal aspect, like you're saying, Ken. For them to be able to see cosplayers, seeing mm. the fans, and getting that experience, which they've never really had before, I can't wait. Yeah, I'm really excited by this. I, I normally like, yeah, I, I've seen the films. What what am I exactly going to get by seeing it in the theater again? So I haven't raced out to a lot. But then last year uh, at the uh, Academy Museum, which is a, a beautiful mm. black and red theater that looks like Palpatine designed it, mm. uh, saw the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi with just an incredibly enthusiastic audience. And honestly, seeing it on the big screen, I did focus on different parts of it, not being able to pause, mm -hmm. watching the flow of it, hearing what people laughed at, mm -hmm. what I think was intended as a joke at the time, what wasn't. And just having that that experience of seeing it with a large engaged audience made me feel like, oh, I want to see more of these if I can make sure to see them with a large engaged audience. So I think for Phantom Menace, I'm going to try to figure out like, you know, what are the what's the screening time that people are going to be at uh, so I can hopefully experience it with a large group of cheering fans. You know, we're going to talk more about where do people stand with it now, but it's definitely a self-selecting thing of you post about the Phantom Menace on on Facebook. You're still going to get a range of uh, of reactions. I think people who despise it are not going to pay twenty five dollars or whatever it's going to be. Uh, to see it in the theater. So the idea of just sitting with people who are like, I love this, sounds thrilling. And as much as I I loved parts of Phantom Menace when it came out, but it was still a challenging experience for me in 99. So for me, it's also just the experience to sit and see it and enjoy it myself with mm -hmm. no holds barred in some of my grumpy Gen X. Jar Jar should have had a scar. It should have been cooler. Like with some of that stuff gone from me, it will be nice. Mm -hmm to see it that way i really agree with that really good mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh so that is the big announcement there from empire magazine but empire magazine had a, another announcement the day before which is that empire magazine is putting out an empire magazine <laughs> but they got people real real excited uh fans got very excited about this tease from empire magazine featuring obi-wan kenobi's famous hello there line uh which fueled excitement about a possible kenobi related announcement I was sent a, a TikTok <laughs> that broke down all the evidence that there was, was going to be a Kenobi announcement. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that is not what happened. Uh, instead, yeah. Empire revealed an issue celebrating 25 years of the prequels uh, with new cast interviews and collectible covers. So uh, we'll talk about the ups and downs, but we're going to start with the positive. Jennifer, uh, what are you hoping to glean from fresh interviews with the cast of the prequels? I think that there's going to be a lot of 
wounds that were kind of healed in some sense for Hayden Christensen, for Ahmed Best. I feel like so, so many more fans have embraced them and they've obviously become huge parts of Star Wars properties uh, on Disney+. Plus. Um, I personally want to hear more fun BTS stories. Mm-hmm. I would love an interview with George Lucas. I don't know, just some... Mm. Just some things like that, um, because I don't know. I we're so we have so much access to them. What can they tell us? Except now it's just going to be in print form. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. I like yeah. the covers. I think the covers look cool. Yeah, the covers are great, and I and I do like that it's a marking twenty five years of the the prequel era beginning, as opposed mm-hmm. to just a Phantom Menace uh, coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken, how about you? Do, you? do you have hopes for what sort of uh, new or fresh perspectives or ideas that we could possibly hear from these, uh, you know, uh, these interviews yeah. that they're really touting is, is the strength of the magazine? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, the list of names they've revealed so far is great. I, I, I know there's a lot of conversation out there, out there about Jake Lloyd. And, you know, I, mm. I, I think the reality I would love to, I would love to right? I would love to have him um, uh, in there. I uh, I don't know if he needs it. He doesn't notice anything, and certainly with the, the the struggles he's had, uh, if 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 being there is not healthy for him, I think we all respect that. So I'm gonna uh, you know just want to acknowledge it, but put that there. I think the other people involved. I mean, Natalie Portman, um, she's spoken on the prequels over the years, or even you know done parody rap videos uh, <laughs> addressing some of the issues in them, which are hilarious. Uh, but to get her perspective, and 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 I wonder how honest they're going to be in terms of what we went through there's been those times that hayden and ewan during the kenobi uh, uh press train of, of of you know it's nice to be back with people who actually like what we did <laughs> or mm-hmm. ewan kind of having the oh yeah for years uh, these were taken uh, received as well uh and to have them kind of now addressing 25 years two and a half decades of this and we've we've known the stories uh, in passing, but actually, you know, if, if we're going to read them from their mouths, I think that's I'm, I'm open to whatever they're going to bring to the conversation. It's just fascinating that they're doing it. But and, and, and not a surprise to me, but fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I am very hopeful, like Jennifer was saying, for any sort of behind the scenes uh, tidbits that, you know, mm-hmm. we haven't heard, uh, you know, just really kind of real life stuff of, hey, Natalie Portman, do you remember talking to Kira Knightley or <laughs> that kind of stuff? <laughs> um, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I, I think more than anything, uh, I'm the, the way that, um, Ewan hugely has talked about it, Hayden mm-hmm. too, but Ahmed best where we have this sort of happier ending where people have come around on the prequels. So it feels that we have both the happy ending and the distance of time where mm-hmm. they are comfortable with being brutally honest about how difficult the reception was mm-hmm. and, and, and what it did to them. Uh, Ewan was on uh, Jimmy Kimmel and and there was, it was speaking very positively about Star Wars, but there was a part where he talked about how horrible the backlash was to the Phantom Menace. And he said, and then we had, knowing that that was the response, we had to make two more of them. And oh the audience God. laughs and he goes, that wasn't really meant to be a joke. But anyway, um, <laughs> but like he's been out front, <laughs> Ahmed Bess has been out front saying, here's the the hell we went through. I think Natalie Portman has given a little bit of an interview about that, but Natalie Portman and Samuel Jackson, if they were going to go in a little bit deeper of like, we've come out the other end, the sun is Mm -hmm. shining. People Mm -hmm. love these movies. Now they worked so we can be really honest about how hard the reception was back in the day. Samuel Jackson's an interesting one too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's he's celebratory uh, now and, and it's probably been rightfully protective and, excited about what he got to do with as mace but yeah that that went that was you know that was samuel L. jackson he was such a known quantity and then to have them go through that at the time yeah i'd love to i'd love to hear those tales yeah, yeah and for samuel jackson too just kind of where it stands in his career because he mm-hmm. was very typecast before phantom menace came out so everybody was making their oh he's gonna be a swearing jedi he's he, yeah, yeah let's mash up star wars and pulp fiction quotes and now his career is so you know spread out uh, in so many different ways to see or him kind of reflect on what is, where does he think Mace fits in his legacy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would be cool. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. So we've talked about this a, a little bit, but I want to dive deeper as we are really beginning the, uh, the prequel anniversary March. <laughs> uh, well, you know, some people, including many in, in our generation of uh, Gen X, I think are always going to dislike the prequels uh, at 25 years. Has the narrative 
fully changed about the quality of the films. Ken, do you think do you think the narrative has changed and it's going to stay changed that these are legendary, beloved, iconic Star Wars films? I think it has, and I think it will remain so in terms of, yeah, the, the discussion has changed. It's fascinating to see some of the reactions um, because, you know, if you're in a certain kind of bubble or an algorithmic bubble on your social media, whatever platform you choose, you're going to see people we know, podcasters we know, youngsters we know. By youngsters, I mean now they're in their mid-30s. But they have, they're like, yes, now is the time. Now is our time. We had to spend 25 years hearing all this stuff from you oldies, and <laughs> this is our truth. Uh, and, and then play that against what I experience, um, in, and even just my friend groups, not online, who are the people that are, are they're not angry car guys on YouTube. They're not, they're just like kind of come. They, I, I've gotten this question a few times. Got it in my house one night on a, on a birthday celebration years ago. Someone walked in and was like, I hear you like the prequels. The first <laughs> words out of their mouth. And, <laughs> and I think it's because there's a lot of folks who just aren't in the Star Wars ecosystem like we are, whether it's a fan podcast or whatever. And they're kind of like, I thought we determined these suck. <laughs> didn't, we de didn't we determine mm -hmm. that? What happened? And they're checking back in going, I'm confused. This isn't a joke release? Like, wait, this isn't Rift Tracks doing a, a Phantom Menace a, a thing? Which, by the way, I'd probably want to see anyways. But... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, and, and so I, I, I'm fascinated by that and how that's going to play out and the conversations we're going to have of, of, yes, you know, we in 1999 determined that we did not like these. That was our generation and maybe the ones mm -hmm. before. This is a new generation and they have the narrative. They have the helm on this thing. That's kind of what's fascinating to me about the discussion this week and, and, and going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I don't feel in any way that like just like the, the snark uh, is gone or the or the yeah. legitimate opinions that that film doesn't work for me. I'm I am you right. know knocked out by this moment of CGI. I'm knocked out by the the range from Jar Jar stepping in poopy to Darth Maul being a terrifying satanic figure. Hey, that's doesn't work for me. Um, yeah. There's plenty of people who might dislike the films, including some millennials and Gen Z. And if I just posted a I love Phantom Menace post on Facebook, I would hear from some of the uh, people my age uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Who, who still dislike it. So I'm not in any way saying everybody loves it now and you or you have to love it. But there is, I think, this kind of fascinating cultural thing that you were touching on, Ken, that there's individual opinion, there's debate, there's discussion. And then I think there gets to be this sort of zeitgeist feeling where it's like a film or a television show has been taken to a court of law and a yeah. judgment has been made by all of society. And for years, Phantom Menace was found guilty of being bad in mm -hmm. the court of public opinion. And I feel like that sort of agreed upon this stamp, it is bad, period. Like I think um, even modern films right, right now, like uh, you know, Thor Love and Thunder, the cultural opinion is, it is bad. You can find people who like it and will defend it. But the right. overall cultural opinion stamped with it's bad and it will be yeah. revisited later in other in other times. And I feel like we have kind of moved beyond. I feel like that court decision has been flipped in that there are more voices in larger cultural agreement that this is an important film, a, an iconic film, a legendary film. And, you know, there, there's still going to be people who dislike it. But the decision has been overturned, and now people disliking it are are more like I, the the voices aren't as loud, and it's more like they're at a restaurant looking over at somebody else eating something they like and going, "I that's bad," and the people who <laughs> who are eating it going, "Cool, you don't have to eat yeah. it," you yeah. know. Jennifer, yeah, the, how do you feel? Oh, go ahead, Ken. Well, I just say the the appeal in the case, the people versus George Lucas, has been you know heard and overturned, and uh, yes, I think that's the case. And a quick note on that: doc. I have two friends who are in that doc. Uh, Mark Riley and Michael Carnaccia, who I saw this weekend at a baby shower, and can confirm that there was some lying and and misrepresentation uh, representation about what that doc was going to be when mm. they got a lot of people Ooh. for the interview. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Mm. Jennifer, yeah. how do you feel? Yeah. I think it's totally shifted. And I think it's because the majority of people online are younger people and they're expressing their love. I find that if I were to post something negative now, I would get pounced on by the Star Wars community because it is so loved. I think what happened was is that you had movie critics who were older when The Phantom Menace came out. They hated it 
lot of those people are dead. You have, <laughs> dead, right? They're dead. You can't say anything. So now the majority of movie reviewers and critics. Two thumbs, six feet under now. Okay. <laughs> but the thing about the movie critics now, the movie Landa reviewers. Goes <laughs> sorry, you guys, but it's true. They can't say anything. It is. So, it is. But I mean, and, and, and like even I hate to say it, people from our generation too, right? Was, we're going back to what we were talking about. So, so that's and, and then people from our generation are not as online. They're not going to be arguing about Star Wars, right? Yeah. Then you mm-hmm. have the other camp, or the the Disney sucks camp. Oh who yeah. Now, before they hated the prequels, they've now shifted their hate to Disney and Kathleen Kennedy, and they're like, actually, those prequels are good. George Lucas was a genius. He did, he just I'm like, wait, weren't you before Disney? Weren't you guys hating on the prequels? So you have that camp. Then you have the movie reviewers and and the people that we know, right? Who who are younger, who love the Phantom Menace, and so they're spreading that positivity. And all of that combined has totally changed the narrative. And I think you also have older people who are going to take their kids to go see it, like me. So I don't know. It's it's fascinating. It's really fascinating to see how how things come around, how culture yeah. changes. It's a Wonderful Life was a uh, box office flop that was considered mid by the critics for mm-hmm. decades, and now it does not have that stamp. It's, there you go. It's it's a larger discussion, one we've maybe touched on before, and we'll touch again, and and maybe this may it is it is the time of of I I, like I know some people in the movie review world who again these are not the bad examples of folks out there these are, these are people good at the job very smart very intelligent and they 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 struggle to wrap their head around the prequels specifically because yes there's some probably objective things you can point at and say well that didn't this that and that didn't work and that was problem there's those things that are, are we should not be afraid to hear or discuss the star wars fans and mm-hmm. i would say that even to the younger generation like it, it's it don't don't worry you're uh, i know there's some scars you got some scarring from the last 25 years but let those discussions happen they're okay they're valuable but uh, same just like i you know stuff about i like about you know book of boba fett i, I have to be open to the criticisms because a lot of them are just actual valid uh, you know observations about the show um, but they stro- those folks in my life struggle to accept the, the culture around them. Mm-hmm. Um, this mm-hmm. isn't just going back to say, I don't know, Flight of the Navigator and going, man, I saw that in the theater. I loved it. I, you know, I don't remember it, but it, it, you know, maybe it was a bad film, but I don't, I don't, I don't care if it's a bad film. I love it. It's that, that's, that's a small part of it. But, but Star Wars is so much bigger than Flight of the Navigator or The Last Starfighter mm-hmm. or something from our childhood. So this isn't just going back with nostalgia glasses. Is it a part of it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, the memories of being nine and seeing Phantom Menace are probably strong, but it, they struggle to accept the bigger picture. It's like a baseball statistician going, well, this player's stats are this, and that means he's this kind of player, and the coach is going, but his heart, you got it, his heart, you're not measuring his heart. They struggle to measure the heart of the Phantom mm. Menace prequel generation. Mm. Yeah. Well, no, I would agree with that, and <laughs> I I think that about the film, too. I still, some of the criticisms that I had in, in 99 have evaporated, but I still have some things like, yeah, I think that there are all sorts of moments throughout the prequels where George's lack of interest in really having a dialogue with the actors, there's some beats for that shows for me. Uh, yeah. There are some things that are like, that is, a, that is a structural choice that's really different. You can debate whether that works or not. Um, but those are all for me. All of the sort of criticisms are like, well, let's, Let's really run down this one idea and have a discussion about them. And maybe it works for you. Maybe it doesn't. But Mm -hmm. to your great point, Ken, that's not the heart of it. The heart Mm -hmm. of it is these films are incredibly expensive indie movies that are the work of a, a, an auteur who happened to capture the imagination of a huge amount of people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, everybody makes the jokes about David Lynch uh, being asked to read, to direct Return of the Jedi, having one meeting with Lucas and saying no. But what Lynch says in that famous clip where he tells the whole story is, I didn't want to direct it because George should direct it. He's got this weird vision and it's absolutely his. The only, David Lynch says the only difference between me and George Lucas is more people actually, that, that millions of people actually like what he makes. Hmm. Uh, and <laughs> that that's the heart of it to me. They are weird auteur films that happen to hit this cultural zeitgeist and and that's the mm-hmm. heart of the film and and the in the prequels and why i love them well i can still agree with lots of individual little criticisms yeah yeah mm-hmm. 
Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the false hype. <laughs> uh, did we fall for the hype that this might be a larger announcement? Again, Empire put out, hey, this time uh, uh, in, in UK time, big announcement with just the text hello there. Uh, Ken, did you fall for there being a larger announcement? Uh, and if so, why or why not? Look, I, I'm going to say I didn't and maybe smugly. However, that's incorrect mm -hmm. because I had also had cleared my afternoon with you, Joseph, to maybe go live. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe i'm maybe i'm just being a little too cocky about what i thought the only thing I, when, when, you know we'll talk about the actual hello there and the use of it and, and it was odd timing with a recent interview clip from from you mcgregor out there um but i i texted a couple friends you know who were like what do you think and i literally wrote back i, I think it's gonna be an article about star wars that's what i think <laughs> but um Again, you you and I were talking, and we were thinking, what what can we do, and and maybe we can go live if it's if it's big. And I wanted that. I wanted mm -hmm. that. You wanted so the fun of it. Maybe I did. Uh, you know, I have to admit, it's okay to admit it. I fell for the hype because I wanted something to be excited about, and I am excited about this. But I wanted something large. Yeah, mm. we both had really busy Fridays, but I had I, I started uh, a text to you and then deleted it. If you happen to see three dots popping up, they're like, should we just go live <laughs> on Friday and treat this Empire magazine like it is as big a news <laughs> as a Kenobi season two? Huge Star yeah. Wars news. Uh, Jennifer, did you fall for the there's a big announcement, perhaps Kenobi related hype? Or not? When was this announcement made? Thursday? They said that they said that yeah. they were teasing it for a Friday yeah. thing. I have no idea. I saw nothing of this hype, absolutely nothing. And I only saw Star Wars, the official account, saying that Phantom Menace is going to be back in theaters. I'm like, yay. And then when we were talking about this show, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what hype? What falls <laughs> hype? I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah, this is inside the bubble on social media stuff. Uh, which I'm not even on social media as often, but this one, you know, raised to the top, uh, rose to the top mm -hmm. because it was, mm -hmm. it was right there. Um, I did fall for it a, a little bit. Um, I, I do think the hello there was, uh, was misleading. Um, Ewan had, and then there was, it was just supported by happenstance. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, th this person had put together a TikTok video that looked mm, pretty, pretty realistic. Hello there was like, and as people were discussing, like, well, maybe it's just an Empire Magazine article. Maybe it's the a trailer for Acolyte. Uh, but it seems weird to be using Obi-Wan Kenobi's line for that. You and had just been on Jimmy Kimmel saying lovely things. And this person who, who put together like a, a TikTok detective video had featured that that Star Wars had put out on their official TikTok a celebration of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I didn't realize that they had been doing a series of TikToks celebrating individual characters to highlight what you could watch on Disney Plus. Yes. And that it was mm -hmm. just like, so I think it, have, it, it has to be just total happenstance that they put that out on the same day that Empire put out the Hello There teaser. So like, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to berate people too much for following a lot of the the leads that were there. Um and then one of the talking points was for people who didn't fall for the hype, those people very accurately said Empire Magazine doesn't announce things. Mm. And then Empire Magazine announced the Phantom Menace re-release the next day. So mm -hmm. it changes who's going to announce things. Historically, Empire Magazine doesn't, but they did the next day. So who knows? So I, I did uh, fall for it a little bit, and I think I was giving in to my... My optimism, my hope for Kenobi season two. Mm. That's not bad. It's an okay thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh. and, I'll say, and I'll say this. I remember a couple years ago, Grace would show me uh, TikTok videos uh, uh, with the conspiracy theory that like Britney Spears hadn't actually been seen in public for years. And after a couple of videos, you're, you're like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Whether it's true, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Now, Maybe now there never was a Kenobi knives. show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now she's dancing with knives. I, I've seen her, but like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. Dude. And again, at the end of the day, it's fun. A little it hype is, is fun. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Empire Magazine also then put out the uh, the Anakin and Padme meme from Attack of the Clones, uh, making fun of the situation because mm. their comments were full of, I thought this was Kenobi season two. Oh. So they, they like, we, we got a big announcement tomorrow. And, you know, Padme saying, 
about Kenobi season two, right? Right. That Anakin Padme meme. So either they knew what they were doing mm. and leaned into it or they realized, oh, we did not yeah. mean to start mm. off that firestorm with the hello there. So we'll try to make it OK with a meme. I think it was a ladder. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. the difference between pessimistic and optimistic people. I'm a, kind of more of a pessimistic. I'd be like, nah, it's not going to be anything big. You're an optimist. I like that. <laughs> I admire that about you. <laughs> mm, the line between optimist and, and fool is, is a dangerous one. A dangerous yeah. one that I need to watch out for. But anyway, uh, so I, I did just want to ask the, the bias question since it, it all of this stirred up the Kenobi hopes. Uh, I'd really like a Kenobi season two or a one-off film, you know, for Disney plus, maybe not a full release because the, the film docket is full. Uh, I think there's, you know, more story to be told and Ewan McGregor is so on board and the window for him to play the character is going to mm. close eventually, mm. uh, particularly with the, yeah, this, the, this long journey to have the character slowly morph from 1999 Ewan McGregor <laughs> mm -hmm. into Alec Guinness is, they're going to be the same exact exact age pretty soon of what Alec Guinness <laughs> was in A New Hope to what Ewan McGregor wow. is in, in real life. Is We're getting real close to that. Um, so how do you both feel about more live action Kenobi? Ken, is that something you're hopeful for? Are you like, if it happens, whatever, where are you I, at? I mean, I'm beyond hopeful. I want it. I yeah. want it. But what if, what if we get a series that leads us up to literally – Kenobi making the crat dragon call and going around the corner to find Luke because Ewan could just now look the part. <laughs> what, if, what if it just goes? He's just like that's the oh, you know oh, that's how the, it fades out on that. Um, I like it. I like it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. oh, with the arms and everything. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 <laughs> and interviews uh, with Ewan. I really studied his arms, especially that we we. Seen one in full action in, in Mandalorian uh, season mm -hmm. two, we'd be like, we'd really have to get into. It. Um, but all jokes aside, I, I, I yeah, I, I, I want it. I agree. With, uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I agreed with you back in the day of y Ewan's in the perfect window to do this. We can't mm -hmm. lose this opportunity. Uh, I think it's the case, and I think if if it's the same kind of cast of characters, whether or not they're co completely involved again, I don't expect Kenobi to go off world to Alderaan. But you, you know, uh, young Leia, uh, 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 Riva, like there's uh, Qui Gon showing up. Whether or not Liam would even know what he's doing if he showed up, I don't care. Uh, get him there. Uh, uh, Owen and Br there's 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 a lot there. This this is this is uh, I, so many tasty morsels to to just chew on as as the story were to continue. So I am overly hopeful. Uh, I just think it's 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 a good thing what and you do do a two-hour tv movie mm -hmm. disney plus movie don't yeah. go to the theater for it you just yeah. you don't need to do six episodes give me give me two hours yeah i think a, i think a two-hour film that's like a limited release in theaters for people who are really excited about it but they're not trying to be like kenobi is how we're you know i know mandalorian and grogu is next but kenobi is not meant to be a make 100 million opening weekend it's yeah. limited release and then it's going to be on disney plus um with a bigger budget. Uh, and I think you could craft a story that is a little bit of a goodbye to Ewan McGregor playing that character. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of great conceits in books and comics over the years of Kenobi being in the desert and looking back on his life. You could do a great live action two hour movie or a limited series of him facing some conflict in the present, uh, training to become one with the force, but looking back on his life, looking back on a moment, he, an adventure he had in the, in the Clone Wars, uh, use Ewan as a framing device and have, you know, young people play Kenobi and Satine on the run. There's a lot that you could do with the character and I think have it be a, a you know, a, a bittersweet send off to uh, to Ewan playing a character. Jennifer, are, are you hopeful? Are you uh, whatever? <laughs> Where are you at? I'm going to be the executive and I'm going to say it's not going to happen because money. And, and the, the reality is, is that there's less shows being made. Well, I guess it could kind of appeal to kids. Less adult theme shows being made. I just saw a statistic for that. I think I loved the show. But it also showed the limitations for me personally of having it on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. For Kenobi to work for me personally, I needed to have a theatrical budget. It needs to be bigger, more expansive. It feels like I don't know, it's like a waste of the character. And I would love for them to make a movie. They're not going to do it. 
Iger is not going to let it happen. And I think at this point, they're going to give that money to new stories. And mm. it's just, it's sad. It's horrible. We want to see him back. You're, you're right. The window is closing. Let mm. him have the swan song as Kenobi. But it's yeah. not going to happen. It's just yeah. As, you know, stories live forever and the actors do, who, who play them do not stay frozen in time. And and I think there was a, a, a an era where where I where executives would be more comfortable with a lot the idea of long tail of like, yeah, yep, this is not this is not going to break even for five years, but it's fine because it's super, super legacy and it has that value. Right. Um, there, there's a part of me this I have no evidence for this at all. This is just total opinion and conjecture. But I think that that the Kenobi show looks and feels sort of limited in its physical scope because I'm sure you McGregor was expensive, but that, that seems like uh chapic purse tightening and i think mm. if i had been there he'd be like no 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 we got we did, this needs to look the best of all of our series in terms of w what we spent on set and uh facts um so there's right. also that part of me right. of just like pe people are so affected by that feeling which i i understand because it is weird to see like this is kenobi and vader two of the largest characters and ewan mcgregor one of the most famous people on earth and they did not that they, they, they didn't get him a bigger set like they it, they look literally physically limited for how big the characters are right uh, and it, it bumps me out that that is an obstacle for people enjoying the show because i think the show itself is great it is great great story great performances great character you're right about the Chapic thing. Oh, that makes me even sadder. <laughs> well, yeah, so come on, Iger. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that, that's rub it in Chapic's my... nose. This is again, <laughs> please nobody run with this. This is a, a random opinion with no evidence whatsoever to support it. It's just my yeah, opinion. yeah. I mean, look, I mean, Chapic got fired at an Elton John concert. I mean, there's that's that's hard enough to take. Just keep rubbing rubbing it in his face. Um, but I, Jenna, to, to your point of like, um, uh, we've discussed some of the the um budget issues or the, the the how the show looked and and you know pandemic going all those things I, I but i agree with you like part of my hope is do, do it again once more the round with just a little bit more up that it's a different time um and and you know um i, I agree at the end of the day maybe if you if you really uh put a, a lightsaber to my my head i would i would say you're right jen but i'm gonna try to choose hope until <laughs> Like, until you are I, 70. Choose the light side. Don't join the dark yeah. side with me. It, you, it, you're not, the dark side is not the realistic side. You're not like, well, there's no point in putting on a movie because nobody will ever mm -hmm. like, you're you're being very realistic. Yeah. And I think you're probably right. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, Iger will will follow the Kenobi fans on a, a damn fool idealistic crusade and make one more Ewan McGregor Kenobi project. What what if the second season is part of this new one point five billion dollar uh, investment into uh, Epic Games? This weird <laughs> thing that I, I look, I I play Fortnite nightly, um, mm. but I don't know what's going. It just yeah, maybe it will be there. Yeah, know. who knows? Who knows? All right, any other thoughts on the uh, the Phantom Menace legitimate hype or the confused Kenobi hype uh, before we take a break? I'm excited for the, the prequel era celebration to really kick off. Uh, 25 years is a big number, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, got fun for us, fun for, for, for fans, and, and I'm looking forward to having those good, constructive conversations off air with those friends of going, yeah, 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 no, things, we've, things have changed. And, and mm -hmm. you don't have to follow all those paths, but they've changed, not just about the movie. It's a generational thing, and, and it's, a, it's a good conversation starter. Absolutely. Uh, so we have a, a book to recommend, an audio book, right? We do, we do. We are doing our Four Center Recommends, an audiobook we think you should try it on us. And hey, it is John Jackson Miller's Kenobi, a book uh, I have not taken a dive into yet. Joseph did, but maybe mm -hmm. I can download my free audiobook today <laughs> by going to audibletrial.com slash Four Center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Four Center and trying it out. Get a free audiobook. Uh, but you, Joseph, you, you endorse it. Well worth oh, the read. Oh. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. And also, hey, Ewan McGregor so loved playing Obi-Wan Kenobi that after he was d done shooting the series, he picked up that book to spend more quality time with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hey, so if mm, Ewan enjoys it, you. you might as well. Hmm. There you go. All right. Uh, on the other side of this break, we are going to do what we actually had planned to do before the news broke last week. Look to Bad Batch Season 3. Hopes, fears, predictions, wants, desires, all those things coming your way right here on Four Center. 
And we're back, of course, if you're on the video side. Uh, still, I'm going to one day not mention it, but it's we're still new to the video side full time. I just love that we freeze like a improv game tableau, a good warm-up improv game. But we're back. Uh, we're back uh, uh, to discuss uh, Bad Batch Season 3, which we all checked our calendars before this recording session. It's, it's here. February's almost gone. Yeah, we are almost here. We're very excited to discuss this because, Jennifer, as you said, You've got all caught up on the second season of Bad Batch recently, so I want to start with your just uh, emotional reactions, your your thought reactions. Which characters or storylines spoke to you? It took me about halfway through the episode. The first half, I was like, oh my gosh, I have 16 episodes to get through. Okay, I got this. And then the second half, I because I you guys have been telling me, no, 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 just wait. This is like serious. This is like cinematic. And I went, oh, they are so right. It is some of the most compelling <laughs> cinematic storytelling. And I don't want to pit shows against each other, but they show the brutality of war. They showed trauma. They showed fear of abandonment, huge issues. And they tackled it in a way that literally kept me on the edge of my seat. Whereas some other live action shows, Star Wars related, have not done that. <laughs> like when Te are we getting into spoilers? Can we uh, uh, spoilers? Oh, spoilers. Yes, full spoilers. spoiler warning. When Ted died, I'm like, oh my, they did it. And it so was you didn't know you it, it wasn't spoiled for you. It you was didn't not know. spoiled to me. It was not spoiled to me, and it was such a shock. And I loved it. I went, wow. thank you for taking that risk and making it feel real. Because at that point on, I'm like, oh, anything can happen, mm -hmm. right? Anything can happen. That's what I wanted to see. That's what I expect from some of these other shows that we don't get. And that to me, I was like, I love that they take risks in this show. They really mm -hmm. push the boundaries. And it's not just a kid's show. That's for sure. No, no. I, so I, think, wrong. I think that's what's... Uh, and I, I get if you've just seen clips or maybe even watched the first episode, like uh, mm -hmm. Wrecker and Omega and their banter and... It, giant it can, crabs you know. yeah giant, right now it, it, it's large and pulpy and there can be like hey we're just on a mission we're having fun like it, it can have a yeah. little bit of almost like that kind of classic 80s saturday morning cartoon vibe but that's just like this little found family story in the face of absolute horror so you're like you're clinging to that bit of humanity and humor that this little family is managing to have in the face of unyielding true no holds barred horror of of war and and an authoritarian government too because it isn't just war it's right being crushed systematically everyone across the galaxy by an authoritarian government yeah. one last thing i want to yeah. mention with omega i always liked omega but my daughter watched one episode with me and she was Omega. Omega was like, she would say mm. something and Omega would literally say the same thing. Mm. Her, wow. She was so wow. connected and it was so authentic to what a child's perspective would be. From that moment on, I looked at Omega in a totally different light and I was like, oh my gosh, oh, this is horrible. I don't want anything to happen to her. Oh, like it just totally changed. And I understood the purpose of her from an audience perspective. If you are a kid and how you would get hooked into this. Oh, it was just brilliant, brilliant. That's I think amazing. it's just so great too. Cause we've, we've had lots of um, kid perspective characters who follow a, some version of the model originally established by Luke Skywalker of, right. you know, somebody who is kind of destined for mm -hmm. something bigger needs to learn, you know, how to handle the power and Omega mm -hmm. really, it, she is, I guess she is sort of special in, in, you know, the whole cloning thing and she might have some value there, but her value ends up being mostly emotional to, uh, to the Camino and scientists. But I, I think it's fascinating because a lot of it, she's just sort of, um, she's just a kid trying to make her way in the world where she, where her, her, you know, 18 dads <laughs> in a good way want to protect her but also need to let her take chances and risks mm -hmm. it's such just a story of of coming of age in a very specific way and and i, I would imagine that's really impactful to a kid because it must be exactly what they're feeling of like i need and want my parents to protect me but also i need to go discover stuff and prove i can do the things that i see the adults doing right and the idea of self-sacrifice and she's like go back wait what like it, that's just so real oh my mm. gosh it's just really incredible 
Yeah. Mm. I, I, look, I, I'm sure maybe some other shows uh, who have parents on them, podcast wise or something, have, have discussed it. So I, I don't want to take credit from anyone else. But yet, I, I, I think I've never heard that really discussed in that way. Of, it wasn't just that it's a character designed to pull in the younger demographic. You're, you're literally saying that your daughter's like, oh, I had that question too, even before she asked it. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. That's an, a fantastic a testament to, to, the, to the character work in this show mm -hmm. uh, and why it is I still think uh, for me, uh, you know, again, not pitting anything against anything because I could sit down and watch Kenobi again and Book of Boba Fett Andorra. But this, this, this has been the, the richest uh, uh, show for me to just enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a part of it of like it's flying under the radar. I don't think anybody knew what to expect mm -hmm. of it. And so it is really just charting its own path, including yeah. one of the things that's most effective for me that, that uh, Ken and I talked a lot about in our discussions uh, was just doing this incredibly minimal storytelling. Uh, mm. you, you said cinematic, but like those, you know, real brutal episodes with Crosshair where it is just it's just emotion and mood carrying you through and, you know, one or two brutal choices that are, you know, just incredibly defining and resonant. But it's it's a specific kind of storytelling that honestly, I feel like Ahsoka has so many plates in the air that it doesn't necessarily have the room to tell a story the way like that. Those crosshair episodes are told and it, it, and it just makes it different. Yeah. yeah, like like no dialogue. You just see him. You he has a look on his face, or he's like digging in the snow. It's just like just moments of almost silence that mm -hmm. I really appreciated. They don't need to telegraph what's happening. They don't telegraph the emotions because we're witnessing it. Show me, not tell me. Right? Mm -hmm. Really, really, it's a risk. It's a risk, especially yeah. in, in an animated show. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's killing it. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, so we're going to do some looking uh, towards season three with hopes, dreams, fears. Uh, there is uh, clearly a, a big focus on Palpatine's important project on Mount Tantus. The season three trailer had a lot of that. Um, we're going to revisit some stuff that, that I think Ken and I have talked about, but we want to get your take on it, Jennifer, uh, as well. Do you have uh, theories or desires about what Palpatine's big plan is? I mean... I would think to reanimate dead soldiers. <laughs> and then like that leads to what Dr. Pershing's doing. It, it, it doesn't work, which is why then they have to do the, what is it? The project resurrection where they have to kidnap the kids. So maybe they're trying this experiment and it fails. I don't know. I, I really, I, I lean on your expertise. <laughs> <laughs> well, speculating. Uh, it, I, I've said this elsewhere. So, uh, so I'll try to uh, keep it short, but, I feel like there's an interesting bait and switch, and I don't know if it's um, mm. intended or not, of uh, Palpatine talking mm. about cloning is understandably going to make fans go, oh, this is a part of him trying to make bodies of himself leading to Snoke. Um, there's a thing with Zillow Beast, the, the Zillow Beast about armor and all that. Uh, but there's this uh, conversation that happens at Tarkin's base when the Imperials are having a meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tarkin says uh, the galaxy is at a critical juncture where allegiances were once divided. We must establish a comprehensive strategy for galactic unification to deter dissent and rampant self-interest. Toward that end, Dr. Hemlock, what do you have to report on your advanced science division? And Hemlock in his deadly little whisper says the progress we are making in the field of cloning is of great importance to the Emperor. Once we fully unlock the secrets previously known only to the Kaminoans, uh, we will ensure... Uh, my, my, the, the imperial power uh <laughs> my my quote uh, did not cut and paste all the way anyway the uh the heart of that to me is what's in that is tarkin is saying we already have too much rebellion too much resistance too much you know um individual thinking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we need to tamp that down and hemlock's bane basically like hey remember when we the cami Owens put a thing in the clones brains to yeah. control their thoughts and mm -hmm. loyalty. What if we could turn that into Wi-Fi? I and see. we could basically be in a star destroyer above Alderaan and inhibitor chip Alderaan. Mm. And now they all think Palpatine is young and powerful and Manchurian candidate. Like he's the best person I've ever known. Mm. Uh, the reason that I'm interested in that is I think it gives the clones a possibility at a victory at something the empire tried that would have been game changing, but didn't get to do. Mm. So it gives the clones a victory and it gives them a victory over something that is at the heart of their existence, which is agency. 
they were created for a purpose, but they were individuals. And so much of the show has been about, we get to choose. We're individuals. Mm -hmm. And now we know we can't bring down the entire empire, but we want to fight for us, for clones. So having mm -hmm. them take down the some big project is a way to give them a victory while still having the empire, you know, succeed in the big continue picture. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That makes sense. Yeah, it it uh, it makes too much sense. That's why it's so good. It's uh, <laughs> and, and and look, I used to work at a YouTube channel where predictions were literally sport. We did episodes where we got points for what we got right, and someone used inside information to always win. But uh, this isn't yeah. that. And yeah. and uh, I, I I joke in the past. I, I sometimes uh, Joseph, you're so so good at some of the stuff that I put, I just put my chips next to yours on the craft table <laughs> or, the, or the roulette table, but. Um, outside of little, little little details, how it plays out, I know you're open ended on that. How uh, you know inhibitor, vis, inhibitor chips, Wi Fi. Uh, I don't know. You you your dad is suddenly against the empire. Great, new dad shows up. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just him. And um, oddly enough, like GI Joe had that with like the the Crimson Guard, which was the red mm. full Cobra guys were clones, and like that would they would be agents. They weren't clones, but they were like lookalikes and they were plastic surgery. And like suddenly Dave down the street wasn't Dave down the street. He was a Cobra mm. agent, but no one knew. Mm. So, yeah, I could I could see it play out in a lot of ways. But it, it's it's what we love to engage with here. It is those themes. It is the reason that you're so right to pull those quotes from, from Tarkin and Hemlock. Um, and, and, and I'm trying to Palpatine at this point in his life. I think he's always thinking endgame. He's always mm -hmm. thinking what he you know talked about with Gallius Rax and all that kind of canon stuff. And without a doubt, some of this could. And and but I go to the Mando stuff of of you know, we saw clones and vats and and I, I was part of you have to keep uh, that open of yeah that that could that could end up to Exegol and Snoke. But mm -hmm. it didn't uh, that didn't align thematically with Moff Gideon in the end, as we said on our live stream. We've said mm -hmm. it here before, and other people said it as well. Moff Gideon wanted to clone himself because he thinks his, himself is pretty cool, and <laughs> he wants just more mm -hmm. of him. He wants mm -hmm. that power. Um, Palpatine wants control. He, he's afraid of it. He's a, a fear, and and and, he, and he's trying it from all angles. And that little line of of the the, the secrets of the uh, you know, Kaminians, uh, it just speaks to something more than just one body, one vessel. It, it speaks to control and, and and tying it into what you're saying, the victory for the clones and what the series, series is, about, is about a lot of things, but clone identity and what mm -hmm. becomes of them after this. We had said before, I think on the last stream too, of up until this series, I think even I fell prey to the idea of like, well, the clones were replaced by stormtroopers. What happened to them? I don't know. It's just a canon thing on this timeline, <laughs> the clones were replaced. Mm -hmm. But now we're dealing with the emotions of that and the themes behind that. So I do go to how does Palpatine use all this to control and keep his power over the people yeah yeah because i think like that that that's a part of palpatine's story is he is he's never it's never enough power and he never feels safe the the dark yeah. side comes with endless paranoia of more power and the more power you get the the more you're afraid you're gonna lose it uh is as palpatine himself said uh the end of that hemlock quote was um once we fully unlock the secrets previously known only to the cami knowns we will ensure an enlightened society through their advanced technology and molecular alteration. So that, oh, that's what really makes me feel like an enlightened society being code for. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody thinking Palpatine's their best friend. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, wow. Um, so the second season also ended on a cliffhanger uh, that the technician at Mount Tantis, Emery Carr, is uh, claiming to be Omega's sister. Jen, how did that hit you? What's valuable or interesting to you about that story? Nine o'clock last night, I was shouted at my computer, what? What? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this changes everything. Does it mean that the Kaminoans had a secret batch of female clones? Is Hemlock doing his, making his own clones that are able to age rapidly, right? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. mm, the timing on that. Uh, could she actually be Django Fett's like real life sister? Like I just was, I didn't mm. know where to go. I didn't mm, know where mm, to go. And I'm like, mm. that's when I checked. I was like, when is when is this season three coming? Because I need an answer on that one. Django <laughs> Fett's nice real answer. life actual sister is something that never occurred to me. That's really mm. cool. That's really I mean, interesting. Maybe that's the younger sister, right? Younger yeah. sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Django led a, a hard life. Um, 
Ken, what, how do you how are you feeling about that uh, the sister surprise? It is it's, it it was a surprise because I think I got so wrapped up in some of the other storylines and the emotional stuff and the the, the 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 tech situation and the sadness mm-hmm. there that when that reveal happened, I had that big like. Oh yeah, Omega is part of yeah, Boba Fett. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> like, like, and I'm with you, Jen. It's one of the we could talk uh, these big, wonderful, grand thematic wants and desires and connections, but that's one of the actual like plot points I'm excited to get to. I don't quite know. I don't quite know where they're going with it, but I think it does tie into the the, the smaller part of the bigger picture around Omega of who she actually is, what she was actually for. Uh, how, how much is Emery saying, you know, how much of that 100% true? Or, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm Django's younger sister. I, I I was still in school on the moons of Bogdan when, when you know, <laughs> Duke came by. Um, and, 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 and how does that, you know, factor into to the bigger picture is I'm just – that's one of the things I will just say without having any specific prediction. I'm just excited because it was such a good reveal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it is just sort of one thing on top of another because there is obviously the uh, the tech tragedy, the fact that Sid did uh, betray oh, them, yes. the fact that, you know, this is the worst thing possible for Hunter and Wrecker, that they've been trying to, you know, keep Omega safe and she's gone. And, and you know, is Crosshair going to make a, another good decision there? It was already loaded before the, yeah. mm-hmm. the sister pop mm-hmm. right at the end. So I think yeah. I, and I've heard other people who love it go like oh yeah i forgot about that because it was on top of it was that cherry on top of uh yep. you know emotionally complex <laughs> sunday mm-hmm. totally but i think for me what's really interesting about it is you know star wars has always had this uh uh examination of family of uh mm-hmm. you know parents of in siblings of of birth the birth family versus a, a found family that you make yourself versus a, a clone family of they are you but they aren't you literally physically uh is just another way to explore family and omega has been so defined by i think kind of having a family relationship with the the kaminoans and and that's what's being manipulated now of uh you know that that uh, hemlock got omega not necessarily for some great scientific purpose but to make nala say work Mm. um and uh, Omega has wanted this family. It's a squad. They keep talking about a squad and, and they mean it in a kind of a military way, but it's also coded as family. So mm-hmm. for this young girl who's also already sort of loaded down with different ideas of what family could be and what it means to her, I think what's kind of tantalizing about that is what does Emery Carr want? Is this, mm-hmm. yep, your family in that, your, your clone sisters, the same way that all the clones are clone brothers, yeah. But not a, you're not a family of choice kind of person. Mm, like mm-hmm. you want something out of me, and you want to manipulate what family means, but not that. But what you want out of me is not what I think of as family from Omega's perspective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that, and it, kind of a driving the point home of found family versus family. Uh, it, it, not not like some of the stuff that we've seen play out, even in the Ray. That's that's one of the things I, I do like about the Ray. And her family line of of uh, you know look at where you're from and and that doesn't define you uh, and mm-hmm. that could, you know mm. um, that could work here as well mm-hmm. yeah yeah absolutely so yeah and and I am also very curious to see like is this there's also just like the she's older she's what I'm gonna become mm-hmm. you know yep. and and that sort of sibling like looking up but also just mm-hmm. really tantalizing of like are there thousands of these clones somewhere yeah is mm-hmm. great. Right. Yep. So, Jennifer, what other uh, major plot points or themes do you hope to see resolved, addressed? Uh, you know, when you said you finished watching it, and you're like, "All right, where, where's season three? What are you what are you hoping for?" I well, I really like the character of Hemlock, and I, I had to look it up because I'm like, I know that voice, and he's voiced by Jimmy Simpson, who I, I really like as an mm-hmm. actor, which explains why mm-hmm. I really like the character. So <laughs> I'm excited to see more of that. I'm excited to see potentially who's going to die next. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gonna die now? Because I'm like, anything can happen. Anything can happen with this show. I love that. And uh, people who and reviewed I, The Phantom Menace in 1999. <laughs> right, right. So, and my hope is that obviously Omega will live, mm. that we could potentially see mm. her in live action, maybe a little bit older. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what's next, which I think is part of the fun. Mm. Yeah. Ken, what are you, what themes or ideas or plot points are, uh, are you concentrating on? 
just looking at some of the major plot points, you mentioned Sid. I kind of forgot yeah. Yeah. what Sid did. And I have this, you know, special place, place in my heart for Sid. Rhea Perlman, like, oh, you know, I, I liked the character. And I, ah, you did, you did what you did. So there's stuff like that. I, I think in terms of um, even going back to what you were talking about earlier, Joseph, what we're talking about with the Mount, Mount Tanda stuff, and it's towards the big end goal, right? Uh, the clones, the Bad Batch, they need this win because without this win, if if it's what you're talking about or what we're discussing about the Palpatine yeah, using systems to, to, yeah, could be wrong, using systems to control the people. If they don't get that victory, we don't have the rebellion. We don't have the dissension. We don't have the pockets. We don't have Luthan Rail. We don't have Mon Mothma. We might have Perrin, but we don't have all these kind of people to, to go through. Um, that's the, the that's why it's a victory for them as clones and the identity of the clones, but also the overall picture. And so, therefore, you have a lot of characters. You mentioned we're going to talk about some that pop up, but I'll say one now, Wolf, but we have Rex. We have all these people that, whether or not some die per Jen's wishes uh, <laughs> and desires, <laughs> Where do they go? What's the happy ending might be in the story? Do they go back to a, a, find another wonderful planet to hide out on and, and live the rest of their days? Or are they now part of the bigger fight in their own ways? And mm. what sends Rex and Gregor mm -hmm. and Wolf off to where they're kind of hiding out? We know Ahsoka's out there somewhere. I do not expect Ahsoka to show up in this season. Uh, but also, who knows? Because stuff's going on. Bail Organa might be a character that shows up. Um, all that stuff, you know, because you, ha you have the Palpatine, you have the government of all, but where do they go? So beyond just a complete, hopefully somewhat happy ending for yeah. these characters in the show, the bigger picture is still above it all. The rebellion is 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 just being born, and 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 where do those characters factor into the story going forward? And and how far do we, would we expect them to go? You know, I don't expect Hunter to be, and I was on the Battle of Endor as well. Like I I don't necessarily expect that, or want that. Um, but setting up what comes next. Yeah, yeah. Where where. I, with Wolf being in this, Gregor having been established, I can see a, a closing montage of them settling <laughs> on the planet they're found on in, in Rebels. Right. But mm -hmm. that really leaves our, our main crew to say, what right. is their happy ending? Uh, there's definite fears and uh, and frozen uh, screen grabs from the season three trailer that makes it feel like mm -hmm. Pabu ain't <laughs> where they're going to end up, that there's that fear there. So, yeah, how they're going to end up is huge for me. Um I wonder if Sid could come back and save the day that it, that Sid could have a little bit of a, a Han Lando story of like mm -hmm. kind of a perfect person to represent um, Palpatine's fears of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. look at, yes, you know, she, she's exactly what Palpatine wants. Somebody who just accepts that mm -hmm. it's not good or bad. It's just the way it is. And we're all out for ourselves. We got to do what we got to do. And then she, she, is so performed well by Rhea Perlman and the animators to just make her look like she is ashamed of herself. Oh, yeah. In that final yeah, it's episode, so good. Right. It's so mm -hmm. good. So mm -hmm. I kind of want to see Sid uh, uh, save herself. I kind of feel like Crosshair is going to go out in a blaze of glory because I just feel like, yeah, he can't live a life where he isn't a soldier. He mm -hmm. can make yeah. a, he can make a choice to use his, his abilities against the empire. Yeah. Or at least against Hemlock. Uh, but I just don't think he can. I don't think he's going to spend his days fishing with a uh, toothpick no. in his mouth. I think he's going out in a blaze of glory. There's um, your death, Jed. There's your death. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he's going he's gonna to yell the Doc Skurlock Young Guns 2 line, I shall finish the game. And he's going to. Because just gonna, thinking of, gonna, exactly. <laughs> I shall uh, finish the game. Jen, I have an upsetting tech theory, and I know it's upsetting because people. Oh, that he comes me. back to life? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't dead? Worse, nope. Jen. No, it's worse. worse. Uh, so it is. It is predicated on the the uh, moment of Hemlock throwing the goggles and saying this was all that's left. Um, mm. uh, so I don't. I think that is an experiment. Tech might be cloned from his remains, oh, which shit. create which makes this incredibly interesting and painful story yeah. that relates to being a clone of how much are we what we are made of versus how much are we our experiences because it could be this incredibly bittersweet story of tech is back and he is he has the same outlook on life he has the same skills but he ain't there tech because he doesn't have the life experiences mm. that cause that tech to grow and evolve um i think if tech comes back in any way it isn't just going to be like i only broke my leg or <laughs> You know, right. partially because we've done that story with Echo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. If, you know, if the if Echo hadn't been a part of the story and it, poor Tech was just like, you know, 
in an eyeball in a in a toe and the rest was all made out of machinery but i feel like we did that story with echo mm -hmm. so i feel like if tech was to come back at all that that's my other wild bad batch theory new tech not the same as the old tech because we are partially made mm -hmm. by our experiences what do you think of that uh uh theory jen that's good. It's gut wrenching too. It's gonna. It's just gonna. They're gonna amp up the emotion. Oh my goodness! It's gonna be horrible, horrible yet thrilling to watch. <laughs> <laughs> a great description of Bad Batch. Yeah. What, what I love about the theory, it, it's it's a it's a really good and painful one. But anytime you mention it, you can immediately cut to the next Star Wars Explained Q and A episode where Alex does the Michael Sarah David Cross Arrested Development sad music walk. Of just <laughs> heartbroken. <laughs> heartbroken. It's, uh, it's my favorite routine on Saturday mornings. I fire up uh, the PlayStation breakfast and YouTube and I put on Alex and Molly's uh, Q&A vids, vids that Molly does a great job of editing. And uh, Molly, I want that in there. I want that in there. Mm. Alex just sad walking with the thoughts of clone tech in his head. Mm, mm, yeah, that is, that's legitimate. That is legitimate. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, a few more ideas about Bad Batch season three. Um, we got some characters popping up in the trailer, of course. Uh, Cad Bane, uh, the clone wolf, uh, Fennec Shand, and hey, you know, Asajj Ventress. Uh, any thoughts on those characters, those known characters who are returning to Bad Batch, Jennifer? Of course, Asajj Ventress is on my mind. Did the Night Sisters resurrect her? I would love that. More likely, it's a flashback, you know. But then I'm like, why are they bringing this major character, fan favorite, back? Unless they're going to maybe use her somewhere else. Ah, it, could she only just be coming back for one episode? Come on. So that's when I start to go crazy conspiracy theory. Yeah, I don't think it's a crazy conspiracy theory at this point. I think most fans agree with you because they had they put out in a, in a statement a little bit after the trailer uh, with an article on StarWars.com of like, we are respecting the events of the book where she passed dark disciple and we're we're well aware of those events and we are respecting them don't know that they would do that for a flashback so you know mm. most fans are feeling yeah. that, that it isn't wild conjecture um yeah. and and i mean like look hey we're celebrating phantom menace where darth maul gets cut in half because at the time george lucas said i want everyone to know he's dead and then george lucas changed his mind and he survived on hate and spider legs in comparison to to maul at the end of dark disciple She's lowered into a glowing uh, pit of magic, you know, fluid on her home planet that is renowned for resurrections. So it isn't, by Star Wars standards, that wild. Right, of like green, they, I read the passage, it was like green mm -hmm. liquid, the, the, she could hear the voices of the Night Sisters welcoming her back. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. it's just a continuation of that. Yeah. It's like, where did Asajj die? Oh, on Restoration Planet. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I also like. I I think I'm just in an Arrested Development. I've been watching clips. I, I love mm -hmm. Jen that basically you were you were a uh, uh, Joe Bluth going. What? I, I, you expect me as Asajj Ventures to be in one episode in this five thousand dollars suit? Come on! Like <laughs> the energy is energy is great. Energy is great. The, the Asajj of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. The, no, the Asajj of it all is this big unknown that I'm just. I uh, can't wait to figure out one episode or more shows up elsewhere. I think the possibilities uh, are, are endless with this character right now. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm bracing myself for maybe it's one episode, maybe yeah. two, you yeah. know, characters have gotten, you know, longer features in previous Bad Batch seasons. So, so we'll see. Uh, outside of Asajj, uh, Jennifer, the Cad Bane, Fennec Shand, uh, how do you feel about those characters? That's cool. I mean, it was like with Saw, <laughs> Saw Guerrero. I'm like, cool. I like That's it. Cool. All right. You know, it fits for yeah. the story. It's interesting. It's, it makes sense. It's, you know, these characters that we know would pop up. Uh, but it was a, the Saj Ventress is the one yeah. that really is, yeah, it just pulls my heart. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge. Just a, mm -hmm. a beloved character with a lot of interesting things to do and say. So, like, great. Mm -hmm. um, Cad Bane in... in I always like seeing and hearing Cad Bane because he's great. Fennec is even more interesting to me because we know the path that she's on where she becomes more and more everybody's out for, for themselves. And mm -hmm. so she can have that turn later in the book of Boba Fett show. Um, the, the fevered hopes have been that Cad Bane and Fennec Shan means the possibility of, uh, of young Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. Um, the, there's the the infamous uh, planned Clone Wars arc where uh, young Boba Fett was going to get the armor. He was going to have a duel 
with Cad Bane and kind of have his like his coming of age story that gets started in the Clone Wars complete right. where he he puts on the armor and he's he's fully made as the Boba Fett that we know. And I think there's been a lot of interest in that for Bad Batch because Bad Batch has been a sort of Clone Wars rescue and reclamation project with things like the Zillow Beast and hey, the clones themselves. What happened to them? Um, but also Boba Fett isn't just like a rando. He's Omega's brother. So he has things to say to the story. How do you how would you feel about Boba Fett being included? That'd be fascinating. I mean, that would really it, it would bring the whole plot point to to the forefront. I, I don't know. I, I think that the whole season could be about about their bloodline cloning bloodline. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, talk about family. That would be really fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Ken, how are you feeling these days about the other characters in the trailer? I, I'm I'm really excited about uh, Cad Bane and Fennec Shand and, and and that connection to the Star Wars underworld at this time and it's always there it's always present and and you know, we got Fee Genoa it's kind of connected to that world from a certain mm -hmm. point of view Sid is as well other characters that have been on the show or come back so it all all roads leading to Boba Fett, Boba Fett is not necessarily a hundred percent certain for me but it's it's. It, it'd be really odd because of what you said, what we talked about before of who Omega is or who she could be and who, who she's connected with. It just would seem odd if there wasn't a mention of Boba Fett. You know what I mean? Like just mm. something about it. I, okay. So I don't necessarily mean them – think it means them showing up is 100% is Boba Fett, like I said. But uh, I, I really want it, so it's hard for me – to ignore that the wolf things that you're seeing well uh, as well as just like again uh, someone who seems to be still in the service of the empire at this point and and you know coat the the, the dangling participle of cody out there in the galaxy or whatever mm -hmm. you know there's those kind of answers i want as well but excited about cad bane and Fennec, and it's just cool to have those characters there yeah they're great characters to spend time with and yeah if the boba fett thing doesn't happen that's fine but i just i think he's we know sort of canonically that he becomes absolutely convinced right. that lone wolf is the only way to go and right. he's traveling with kind of a, a group uh in in this era uh yeah. of time so just to have maybe an interaction with omega where he could have had family he could have had connection and omega rejects him for being brutal and right. selfish would maybe kind of harden him into the armor and set him on the path that we know he's on and in, until yep. he has his experiences with the tuscans in book of boba fett I, yeah, he, really great. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and just when I'm saying it would be odd if it didn't, it's a, that's not with a, a clenched fist. It just uh, it no. seems uh, it just seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so who knows? Are there other characters you're hoping to make an appearance, Ken? Who who do you got on your your wish I, list? I'm kind of going. Yeah, we'll we'll you know bring in Hondo watch. I think that remains for mm -hmm. just any Star Wars property, and uh, maybe a young Veers. So let's just get them all. Let's have Veers watch happy. Let's have uh, <laughs> Hondo and uh, those who are participating in Hondo watch happy. Uh, that could work for me. But I, I a little bit more of the political side. I don't expect it. You know, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the in the halls of government uh, on Coruscant, but we we know we got you know anytime Palpatine shows up, there's there's room for that, and we had a little bit of Mon Mothma last time out, right? Um, mm -hmm. But Mothma and Bale and some of those political leaders, um, I, I I you know it, it it's something I'd like to spend some time with, and not expecting it, but it might be a little kind of a quiet want. Yeah, yeah, I would love to see Luthen. Actually, I, mm. I'm not making a prediction. At yeah. all, by any means, but um, I love Andor, but I but I do think that Andor, in some ways, has been, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, um, I I would love to see some of those characters connected to the rest of Star Wars canon. Uh, yeah, I think I think I'm reacting more than anything to some of the fan reaction to Andor that it's like this is peak television, this is prestige television, it is separate mm -hmm. from you know pulpy mm -hmm. Star Wars. So the amount that we can connect it, so it is all part of it. Obviously, there are connections. Mon Mothma, Saw Gerrera, but uh, Luthen popping up in animation for me would be like, you know, this is all connected, everybody. I want Luthen to pop up on the back of a shock, uh, a shack, just riding in with a big butted animal, just uh, you know, eating mantel mix and chasing puffer pigs. I think, yeah, <laughs> Luthen. If Luthen and Dexter could appear together, I would be thrilled. <laughs> That'd be oh great. My gosh. That's where it happens. We're at Dexter's diner, and it re Rex and Hunter talking here in the background. Uh, I, I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> where was Luthen uh, radicalized? Dex's diner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, do you have any other characters you're hoping to make an appearance? 
No, but the Luthan one is great, and Stellan Skarsgård voicing it. Would he do it? I don't know. That'd be that'd be fun. I have no predictions otherwise. I really can't. I can't think of any. Yeah. Or have any hopes or expectations. Yeah. I don't want to be let down. Yeah, I think uh, you know we already have plenty of characters uh, popping up. Um, the other one I think that is on my list is is Quinlan Voss because I think mm. he is yeah. an interesting character. He has uh, you know uh, some ties to Asajj Ventress. Uh, what with them having uh, fallen deeply in love in the Dark Disciple book. Um, and the show has really dealt with seeing the fallout for the Jedi too, with, with Gungi mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with, you know, young Caleb Doom in the, mm -hmm. in the first season. So I, Quinlan would be amazing. Um, this isn't a, a person, but uh, I'd also love to see Naboo. This, um, yeah. a lot of Bad Batch has been a tour of, of different well-known places and some like pretty kind of deep dive places mm -hmm. that are, are like, there's a great uh, episode, I believe in the first season about the, the former separatist world that was now being punished mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for having been a separatist world, all that uh, seeing Naboo being both highlighted and celebrated for being the birthplace of our emperor Mm. And also the kind of planet that the emperor would really want to keep an eye on for anybody disagreeing. Like if they had any, if he did try to create some sort of brain control device, I bet he'd love to test it out on Naboo. Cause that's a planet mm. full of artists and free thinkers mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. he would not be a fan of in this era, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which sounds like you're making a great pitch for, for Jar Jar to show up at some point, And I love it. I'm right there. there with you. Go. Maybe, maybe. Love it. Uh, all right, we got just a few more things to talk about uh, for Bad Batch before we wrap up here. Uh, previous seasons of Bad Batch have told an, an overriding story, but often through adventure or mission of the week type episodes, slowly building the story. Ken, are you expecting the same for season three or do you, are you expecting kind of foot on gas the entire season as a climax? I think there might be foot on gas, uh, which is a, a you know condition some of us have, but I think uh, I, I'm expecting that. However, I don't necessarily expect to, for it to break what it's done the first two mm -hmm. seasons. It ramps everything up without a doubt. And I get, sometimes I run into that criticism with friends offline of Adventure of the Week. And, you know, we heard some of that with Mandalorian. You know, I'm, and I'm not even mentioning the filler, not filler conversation. I'm just saying in general, like, I, I get it. We are in, a, in an era where we like everything to feel connected or feel like it's moving forward. And whether it is or not, sometimes you have a perception uh, much like if we determined in 1999 Phantom Menace is bad, sometimes people are like, we determined that episode of Tech Racing is bad because it didn't connect to the big picture. But we know it did. This is why we have the, the, the term around here of emotional canon. Uh, you know, we, we coined that uh, here back in 2015 or so or coming out of Force Awakens simply because uh, I was. it's how I wrap my head around not the plot points and the beats of the timelines of canon, but how – the end of Han's life connected to where we met him literally 1977 or whenever you first discovered him. The, 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 his emotions, his motivations, his choices, his mistakes, his successes are all connected. That's the canon we're here. These episodes have, uh, you know, especially season two, I think did such a good job of that adventure of the week really does connect or it just sets you up for heartbreak with tech on some levels. Um, I'm rewatching season one right now and I just got to the Moochie episode. It, I, I, back then I was like, that was fun. And, you know, and even now I'm like, that's fun. It doesn't have the bigger weights or the stakes, but it's you're absolutely spending time with them. And that's what this show has the ability to do with 16 or more episodes, not the eight that uh, sometimes we're, we're used to these days. Um, it, it, that's why we get to do it. It is not the filler. It is, it is, it is really spending time with these characters. It's done with great purpose, and I expect it to be the same here. Yeah, I, I really agree. I think a huge amount of the power of it is we have spent time with the characters, and so our emotional investment in them is extremely strong. Tech's yeah. death was devastating. It was he's my favorite character in in the mm -hmm. show. It was really hard for me. It was hard for me as a like. Uh, no, I'm not gonna, maybe I'm not going to get to spend time with Tech. It was even worse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's up and has to be told that he's not coming back, and that. And that, that, yes, you could do a two hour movie where that hits hard, but I think it hits hard because we have watched her <laughs> meet a baby mm -hmm. rancor. We yeah. have watched yeah. her have that conversation in the, the, the crossing episode with tech about uh, how to process change and how different people mm -hmm. might not look like they're processing change, but they are uh, all of those little beats along the way 
uh, are building our emotional relationship with the characters as well as you know building plot points and building emotional trajectories for the characters it's also just building our relationship with them yeah mm -hmm. i think that overriding story was so strong even when they are doing kind of like these adventures and whatever like you both are, are saying that to me is what made it so compelling to watch and what elevated it to beyond just a quote-unquote cartoon but to something quite sophisticated um mm -hmm. and, and yeah. every everything was so intentional and 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 built in so that the, those stakes towards the end of the season it meant something um which again not to criticize but it hasn't been the same for some of the live action stuff i i don't really care for the adventure of the week as much once i know the characters i want there to be more emotional weight i want it to mm -hmm. be leading towards something so um mm -hmm. Yeah, and like cliffhangers, I loved how they really used the cliffhangers towards the end. I thought that was, mm -hmm. and it was helpful for me because I could just go to the next episode. I did not have to wait to find out the answer. Yeah, some brutal cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we wrap up, any other Bad Batch hopes or dreams uh, from you, Ken? Uh, a quick shot of Dengar. That's a character I forgot. Maybe love to see again. Oh, yeah. um, um, uh, the, the, the hope and the dream is the right amount of joy for these characters at the end, whatever kind of happy ending to this story as we move forward, like I said before, there's still the big picture. We've spent now three seasons, three years with these characters. They've they've suffered, they've laughed, they've had mentel mix. Uh, <laughs> as we send them off, um, I, I I'm I'm ho hopeful for some hope and some joy that they get to yeah. they get to experience at the end of this. I really agree with that. I think that that's huge. And that's always been the balance of the show. It's an incredibly dark time and a really hard thing for these characters to lose their identity and have to find it again. But all of that has been contrasted with this beautiful, charming little family finding a way to find joy and laugh about Mantel Mix in, in the face of all this horror. So I do want a, a happy ending for some, you know, amalgamation of our of our core group. Uh, mm -hmm. Other thing for me is I, I, I got to own that I have lots of theories and ideas and, and I really want to be able to let them go. They're fun and they make yeah. sense. But um, but I want to follow the story that these creators came up with. So I want to be really poised <laughs> to let go uh, if, if anything uh, it, it goes in, in different directions. And it's understandable and exciting to talk about Asajj Ventures is huge and, and to have Boba Fett theories. Uh, but I think we saw a little bit of this in the reaction to season two. Like we got so thrilled by the Zillow Beast and by the by Gungi that I think maybe yeah. some of the fan community wasn't focused on the heart, which is mm. the Bad Batch. Yeah. We're going to spend yeah. the yeah. most time with those characters, with Omega, with Crosshair, with Hunter, with Wrecker, maybe with New Tech. I don't know. With Fee. That's the family we're going to spend the majority of our yeah. time with. And that's what I want to look forward to the most and then get the absolute thrill of Ventress and Cad Bane on top of it. But I'm there for the family. I'm there for the core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, any final hopes or dreams for you? I learned a valuable lesson, and that is when the fan community is very excited about something, listen to them and watch it <laughs> while everyone is watching it. So you don't have to binge over an entire weekend. That was my lesson. I will be watching it alongside you guys because it's a great show, and I and I'm sorry that I didn't that I didn't do it sooner. No, well, it's a great experience to binge, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it. That's our big look at our hype for Bad Batch season three coming to us very soon. We are hyped. We are hyped. And we will keep you all updated as the Bad Batch report returns once we determine the actual release of the episodes, when they drop and when we can get together. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to be diving in with that very soon. And it's, uh, you know, because Strike, we didn't get a chance to do week to week with Ahsoka. So I'm excited to kind of get back up on uh, on that uh, rancor uh, and ride mm -hmm. that to week to week review again. Uh, we are found on a lot of spoke on a lot of, a lot of spots. Uh, Twitter and Threads, of course. Force Center Pod Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're on Instagram as well. Podcasts available in a lot of spots: uh, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Among them, merch is available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center, and you can support us directly at patreon.com slash Force Center. As we said at the top of the show, we have launched 007 Center. It's exclusive to all Patreon supporters, but also uh, available for purchase in our shop so if you just want to swing through check it out audio and video versions available and uh, you know i gotta tell you 
breaking down Casino Royale for nearly three hours was one of the highlights of my uh, uh, last few years uh, doing this stuff. It was a lovely, wonderful, I thought, uh, uh, an insightful conversation. Uh, check it out. That's the f big sell I'm going to give you all here. Uh, <laughs> I used to work in a movie theater for a little bit. You want the large soda? I'll, I'll upsell you to 25 cents. There you go. Uh, you can uh, follow and support me if you want at CadNapsock or at CadNapsock.com. Uh, got some uh, dates coming soon. Mark Ellis and I hitting the road. I know Boston is uh, very soon. Uh, information is forthcoming. So get ready, Bean Town. I'm going to make my first trip to you, and we're going to do some comedy. Uh, Jen, uh, where can they follow you? I, you know, you're popping up in my algorithm. That means you're working hard on some great stuff. Oh, good, good. Yeah, you can see my short form Star Wars videos, uh, retro videos on YouTube at Jennifer Landa, or Instagram at Jennifer Landa, or TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where else am I? I'm all over the place. <laughs> It's a lot. I even I'm even on laps. I'm on. I haven't used oh, laps, right. but I'm there. I'm there. Joseph, uh, you're in a lot of spots, including Blue Sky, which uh, you're one of the only people I see on there because I don't follow as many. <laughs> so yeah. I know there's I know there's more people there. But where can they find you? Yeah, you know what? I'll make a I'll make a pitch for Blue Sky. Uh, maybe we can do a subjective wars about uh, Blue Sky versus Threads. Uh, I really enjoy the interface of Blue Sky. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoy the vibe. It used to be the invite code thing. It is now wide open. Wide Anyone can just mm. go and make an account. Um, I know some people are enjoying threads and hey, great, if you enjoy threads, so be it. I want there to be some some Twitter-like replacement that wins the, the Twitter replacement wars. Um, mm -hmm. they, not gonna go into all that, but here's my thing with threads real quick. Uh, it's owned by Instagram and Facebook. Hey, everything we touch is owned by one or two middle-aged men having a crisis and we're all stuck in their midlife crisis. <laughs> Facebook and Instagram are enough. I do not want a third of the most dominant social media sites owned by one weird guy who's going through his own stuff. And then we just have to deal with whatever he's going through. Mm. Uh, yes, Blue Sky is also owned by a midlife crisis billionaire, but a different one. And that, to me, at this point in our culture, is a huge bleep and selling point. So please join me on Blue Sky, owned by a slightly different middle-aged crisis billionaire. Who hung out uh, with Beyonce at the Super Bowl, I saw. Looking oh, real wow. depressed because Blue Sky yeah. was not popping during Super Bowl. So I think yeah. he, I think he was checking his metrics and he was looking sad. Looking yeah. sad. Anyway. Anyway. Find great. me on Blue Sky. Joseph Scrimshaw. The other thing real quick is uh, uh, the short horror film I made with several wonderful people, Ken included, uh, is uh, having a Los Angeles premiere. Uh, the short film is called The Nightmare Adorable. It is going to be playing here in Los Angeles at the Regal Cinemas LA Live on Sunday, February 25th. At 2 p.m., I'm going to have ticket info on all my different social media and my website at josephsgrimshot.com if you're in the Los Angeles area and want to join us there. That is it for me. That is it for uh, us as well. Thank you all for listening. So for all the hype, all the speculation, all the mental mix you can have. We'll see you next time here on Foresight.